Good evening and welcome to the East Bay Ridge Parish Stormwater Master Plan virtual public meeting. My name is Jonathan Hill and I'm a member of the public involvement and communications team for this effort. And we want to welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. I wanna to give a special thank you to our co-host tonight, the East Bay Ridge Parish Library for partners with us in this event as we share this critical information for the citizens of East Baton Rouge Parish. And so tonight, as we begin, we want to remind you that this um, meeting is being recorded and will be available within 72 hours of this event on the project's website at www.stormwater.brla.gov. And so tonight we are here to provide you an update on the Stormwater Master Plan and to uh, get your feedback, your questions and comments. We have members of the project team who are present here with us uh, to answer your questions. Claire, can you hit next on that for me? Sit next on that. All right, so in order to submit your questions and our comments, there is a blue button located on the right side of your screen that says join the podium. Uh, if you have any questions or comments tonight, you can hit that blue button. And after hitting that blue button, you will see a dialog box pop up where you can enter your question and or comment and we'll be prepared to receive them as the night progresses. And so at this time, I want to bring up Melissa Kennedy, who's the project manager for this effort and an engineer with HNTB. Thanks, Jonathan. So I'm going to talk about the stormwater master plan and um, we're going to try and get through the presentation relatively quickly to leave a lot of time for questions. So what you're seeing here is a message from the mayor. This is just showing the mayor's commitment to this project. Um, she basically, when she came into office, she said that this is one of her, her top priorities to address flooding and drainage within the parish. It is really through her leadership and initiative that we are moving forward on trying to come up with the flood risk reduction throughout the parish. So what is the EBR stormwater master plan? Well, it was after, actually implemented after the 2016 event. It'll be the guiding document for the implementation of projects and policies for the overall flood risk reduction throughout the parish. The plan will implement goals and objectives in alignment with other various, other various parish um, programs. One of those being future BR, also the parish hazard mitigation plan, and we're coordinating with the MOVE BR program. In addition, the goals and objectives of this plan are directly in alignment with the Louisiana Watershed Initiative. The plan is intended to be data-driven and science-based and will incorporate climate change. As you know, people have been seeing a more rainfall, higher intensities. The average rainfall for Louisiana is six, or for Baton Rouge is about 62 inches a year. We've already exceeded 45 inches to date. So the stormwater master plan is being developed in three phases. Phase one is the implementation framework and that has been completed. That was prepared based on data, preliminary data collected and a risk analysis conducted to map out the tasks and costs of those items needed to develop the stormwater master plan. Phase two is evaluating the parish watershed based on additional collected data to understand the system and then identify the current and future risk to lead to the development of flood risk mitigation projects and policies. Phase three is the capital improvement plan. Basically it is taking those flood risk projects and policies and determining funding and scheduling for them over a 20 year period. So right now I'm gonna turn it over to Devin Foyle who's gonna give an overview of the stormwater system. So Devin is a planner with HNTB. He's a member of this team. He's a certified floodplain manager and he's a huge proponent of green infrastructure. Devin. Uh, 
Thank you, Melissa, and good evening, everyone. It's good to be here tonight. Uh, as Melissa said, I am an HNTB employee, and I'm also a certified floodplain manager. Um, and tonight I'm going to be talking a little bit about the terms and concepts that are important to understand during the stormwater master planning process. So here on this slide, we have a map of East, East Baton Rouge Parish, um, and it's showing some important things. So the first thing that you notice is probably the color gradient across the map. And that represents the LIDAR imaging. And LIDAR is basically a 3D image of the Earth's surface that's taken by a plane that flew over the parish and uh, scanned the ground with a laser. Most importantly, it shows us the elevation of the land throughout the parish. Um, so although the topography of the parish is relatively flat, um, as you can see here, the land in the northern parts of the parish, um, where it's orange and yellow, that land is relatively high. But as you make your way towards the south, the map gets uh, greener as the elevation gradually decreases and the land gets lower and lower. And then the lowest elevations in the parish are in the southern part where the map starts turning blue. Uh, and if you notice the red arrows, um, these are sudden changes in color and they denote a sudden drop in elevation. Something like a ridge, like a bluff. One of these is uh, approximately where Tiger Bend Road is. So you might also noti notice the shaded in areas on this map. Uh, those are FEMA designated special uh, flood hazard areas, better known as FEMA flood zones. And you can see that the FEMA flood zones, not surprisingly, tend to be located around all the bayous and creeks within the parish. And so the bayous and the creeks all follow gravity and flow down the highest elevation areas, the yellows and the oranges, to the lowest elevation areas, which are the greens and the blues, like I said before. Um, and they flow into the Amate River, which makes up the eastern border of the parish. Um, and then keeps flowing beyond the border into the lower and lower elevation areas, like you can see in the bottom right hand corner down there. Um, so yeah, all of the water flows from high point to low point until it reaches a common outlet. So what we have here, um, this map shows the delineation of the parish's 11 water, 11 major watersheds. Um, just like Melissa said earlier, the boundaries are based on where water goes within each area. And so the stormwater master plan evaluates flood risk at three different levels. Um, the watershed level, which is shown on this map, the local level, and the regional level. And for the local level, we evaluate many sub watersheds within each of these main regions rep represented by the color er areas. And for the regional level, we evaluate the entire parish, just like in the uh, map previously. So, you know, we've mentioned the term watershed several times already but what exactly is a watershed? So a watershed is simply an area of land that water flows through before draining to a same or common outlet like a river, stream, or creek. And the topography of land, um, it determines the divides or boundaries of a watershed. Um, so there's a hierarchy of watersheds. The biggest can be as large as the Mississippi River watershed that drains to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and they can be as small, and they can be as little as a pipe that collects stormwater um, from certain areas and then drains that into a common ditch. So in the parish, water flows in smaller uh, watersheds from high points uh, to low points, which are like streams and creeks, like Ward Creek and Clay Cup Bayou. And on the large scale, all those sub watersheds flow within the bigger watershed to one common outlet, which is the Amy River, like I said earlier, um, just like in that colorful map that we saw. So, so this is the stormwater master plan, but what exactly is the stormwater? Um, so it's also very simple, simple term. Stormwater is water that comes from rain. And when it enters a watershed, stormwater can do one of three things. So it can soak into the ground and become groundwater. It can evaporate and go into the air and atmosphere, or it can run off surfaces into the parish drainage system which is made up of pipes and networks of ditches. And so the runoff in the parish drainage system will ultimately make its way to the streams and creeks and rivers. And so speaking of stormwater and stormwater runoff, it's important to note that 
hard and pervious surfaces can increase the amount of stormwater um, that is within a watershed. And that makes it difficult for stormwater to soak into the ground, the impervious surfaces. And examples of these kinds of surface, surfaces are seen right here on the slide. Uh, roads, parking lots, sidewalks, driveways, and even roofs. Um, and because stormwater can't flow through these surfaces, it, the, the water has no choice but to become runoff. And then the runoff has no choice but to go into the drainage system. And so when I, what do I mean by the drainage system? Um, well, this slide shows the kind of surface and subsurface drainage system that's used in the parish. Subsurface drainage uses a network of underground pipes to guide water away from problem areas um, and into ditches and canals. We, well, surface drainage involves moving excess water, uh, stormwater runoff off the surface of the land by guiding it into shallow ditches. So remember the fact that impervious surfaces can increase amounts and speed of stormwater runoff and that in turn can overwhelm the capacity of these subsurface and surface drainage systems um, before they have a chance to drain into the watershed outlet. And so that can lead to flooding. So there's many types of flooding and causes of flooding. Um, intense rainfall and swollen rivers and streams, they can all lead to flooding. Um, other causes of flooding can range from a lack of maintenance of infrastructure um, stormwater exceeding the design capacity of drainage systems, which just means more water enters the system at one time than it was originally designed to, uh, to, to take. And then there's backwater flooding from downstream systems. And so these factors, along with the historic rainfall and then the subsequent stormwater runoff, uh, really heavily contributed to the August 2016 and May 2021 floods in Baton Rouge. So, that brings us to our topic tonight, and I'm going to uh, hand it over to Melissa to talk about the stormwater master plan. Thanks, Devin. So what is the stormwater master plan? Again, it's a three phase process. Um, as I said, phase one is completed. We are currently in phase two, and this slide shows a little bit more detailed breakdown of those phases. On the left, we, we have the box, which is the identifying and understanding our current and future flood risk. And that is based on the data and survey, um, the data collection and survey that was completed on the stormwater system, which we then take that information, input it into these computer models and evaluate the existing condition. So basically what floods, where does it flood? What's the depth? And then we can use that to help identify the causes of flood that um, Devin just talked about. Once we understand the system and where the problems are, we then need to identify projects. So that's what the next box is, developing measures to mitigate the risk. So we identify these projects and then we again put those in the model to evaluate the effectiveness of those projects to make sure that it's actually performing the desired function and uh, flood risk reduction. Once we do that, we then, then we run a benefit cost analysis to get the benefit cost ratio to make sure those projects are cost effective and economically uh, feasible. And that then ties into the development of our final project list. And then we go into phase three, we take that project list, we prioritize that list and that's all, that will be a, um, a whole process in itself, utilizing stakeholders, the parish, um, scheduling, et cetera. So we'll prior prioritize the projects and then we need to determine how we're going to pay for everything. So we're doing a funding analysis, basically what are the needs of the parish and then where are we going to get the money to pay for everything? And that could cover a number of things. It could cover grants, uh, it could cover fees. Um, we still are looking at that. Um, and then based on that, once we've identified how to pay for it, we're going to take that list of projects and develop a schedule over time, utilizing that funding, which is essentially the capital improvement plan. So understanding the flood risk, how do we do that? Again, um, we did a massive uh, data collection effort that was done in the first year of the program. We started this in January, 2020. 
And what that included was uh, finding out, surveying the existing subsurface system, which includes your manholes, your inlets, your catch basins, your pipes, uh, culverts, and your outfalls. Um, we utilize the GIS online real-time um, program to do this so that we could actually see the data as it's collected, as well as the parish could see the data as it was collected. And we collected information on the type of features for each of the structures and also the condition, a qualitative assessment of the condition, as well as the amount of sediment in each of those. And as I said, this was being able to see, we could see this in real time, so we could find where there were problems and be able to coordinate with the parish to address those uh, immediately if needed. Um, there was one day where the crew called and said they found a sanitary sewer system draining into the storm sewer, which is a no-no. So we're able to coordinate with the parish to get that taken care of immediately. So at the end of that data collection, we were able to provide the parish a GIS database with that information, which also provides an electronic map of the system to the parish. So now they have this database that they can utilize to address their current maintenance issues and also for future operation and maintenance. We also did surveying of the surface channel system. We surveyed over hundreds of miles of drainage channels, including cross sections, bridges, culverts, and other types of features that might be in the channel, such as utility crossings. And that data was collected um, for areas beyond where we did not already have existing information. We were able to use data that had been collected um, previously by others. So then we take that information and we put them into these computerized models. And what does that do? Well, those models will then identify the extent and depth of water for various existing and potential future rain events. Then we, from that, we can also develop flood inundation maps and determine the damages as a result of these different rainfall events. And then utilizing that, we can come up with projects to mitigate the flood risk and then use those models to evaluate the projects. So what you're seeing here are two different maps. And as Devin said earlier, we're doing different levels of modeling. The top one is the watershed level, which Devin talked about. And those are for, um, those will be evaluating a, a myriad of rainfall events over a 24 hour duration. The lower right is our subwatersheds of the subsurface system. We'll be using the PC swim model to for that evaluation and those are for evaluating shorter duration, uh, smaller intensity in that events. And those are uh, six hour duration storms that we'll be evaluating. And then again, as Devin said, we have a regional model that will cover the entire parish. And those we'll do, we'll be evaluating longer duration storms. So what you're seeing here is a simulation of the clay cut watershed for a 13 inch rainfall over a 24 hour period. It starts off a little slow, um, but then uh, you'll see it has how, actually how that water builds up through that system. And then it will show you also how the water dissipates. Uh, if you could stop it there. Anyway, so what that does is shows us again, it's the extent of flooding and we can determine not only the extent, but the depth. And then we can use a different program to determine the damages as a result of each of these events. You can go ahead and make it go through the rest. And the model will show you how the water dissipates as well. Again, that is a 13 inch rainfall over a 24 hour period. It is somewhat similar to the May 2021 event. So what we have here is a zoomed in area of that um, model. And what you're seeing here is how the water actually flows through the system. So this helps us um, really identify how the water flows, where some obstructions can be. 
And you will notice that there is seems to be more water on the lower half of this image than on the upper half. That is Tiger Bend Road along the that kind of separation. And that is there's a ridge along Tiger, Tiger Bend, whereas the area south of there is lower. And hence, we get more water along that area from the clay cut bayou. And I do want to say this does not include the subsurface system. So um, the evaluation of the subsurface system in this, in this modeling, this is a HEC-RAS model. So um, some of that street flooding that you see in here is not necessarily uh, happening. We use the other models to evaluate that. And then we talked about climate change. We said, um, how do we incorporate climate change? That was one of the goals that uh, was set by the parish that they wanted us to address. So what you're seeing here is a graph, and this is based on um, us consulting with local and national climate experts. What this shows is the projection of rainfall increase for different storm events. And this happens to be for a six hour uh, rainfall duration. So on the left, you see the various rainfall depths. And over time, you can see how those rainfall depths increase. So essentially how this works is as the, as the atmosphere warms up, it holds more water vapor and hence more rain. So this is a projection of that climate or this atmosphere warming and then the associated rainfall. So um, I want to show your attention to the red horizontal line on this graph. What that shows, if you look on the left, a seven inch uh, six hour rainfall is a, is a 50 year storm in 2010. If you project that out, that becomes a, um, I think a 25 year storm out in 2065. So you can see how um, the climate impacts the rainfall. And then someone asked, there was a council meeting last night uh, for EBR, and someone asked if the criteria that we're utilizing should be, should be changed as we evaluate our systems and for design. And I said that that is something that we will want to investigate as we start looking at the policies. So how do we go ahead and um, mitigate flood risk? There's various techniques. Uh, again, the first thing we really want to focus on is maintenance of the existing system uh, um, to address those issues. And then not only maintenance of the existing system now, but we want to plan for that continual maintenance going on in the future. Right now, the parish's budget for transportation and drainage maintenance is about $8 million a year. This is definitely not enough money to address maintenance needs. So that's the first thing we want to do. Then we want to look at other flood risk reduction infrastructure methods. That could be um, channel improvements. It could be detention ponds. It could be pumping, levees, uh, bridge replacements, culvert replacements, et cetera. Um, the channel removal of channel restrictions. Um, there are various things that we will evaluate. And then we also want to look at conserving our wetlands and our floodplains. Um, and um, that's what we're trying to show here on the lower right in that picture. And then the last thing is we want to look at our development policies. Are we doing the best we can um, as we develop in the floodplain? Um, so we will definitely be looking at that. The parish has actually been changing their codes regarding development since the 2016 flood. Um, there have been a number of revisions over the years. We also provided some recommendations um, recently that were just adopted last week. But we don't want to stop where we are. We want to continue looking at those policies moving forward. We want to look at the fill impacts. Is the zero net fill um, requirement, is it doing what it's supposed to do? Do we need to increase our freeboard above the base flood elevation? The FEMA maps we know are kind of old and we wanna look at, well, where do we see that 100 year floodplain now? And do we wanna account for now or do we wanna account for also future? So how does that compare to the current published BFE? We wanna look at potential buffer zones uh, along our riparian corridors. 
in addition to conservation districts. And we also, we wanna look, we wanna take a harder look at our drainage requirements. So, but I wanna, I wanna stress that we're not waiting till the end of this plan to make progress. Um, the parish is already moving forward on a number of initiatives. Um, we helped the parish develop projects for the hazard mitigation program, grant program. Six of those projects have been approved by FEMA and they're on their way to design and construction. Two of them, uh, design consultants are, the designs are in process. Three of them, design consultants are going to be selected shortly, if not already. Um, one of those projects was recently approved by FEMA and we actually are waiting for FEMA to approve one other project. There are also, and those, and those add up to about 69.7 million. And then there was about 14.3 million in um, watershed initiative projects. There were two floodplain preservation projects recently approved. And we have other projects that are out there that will be um, submitted in round two of the watershed initiative projects. And then last we have 20 million from the CARES Act that the parish is, is applying to maintenance. That will be for the channel clearing, uh, roadside ditch cleaning and cave-ins, and then cleaning out of the subsurface system where there are problems. And that was approved, that money was approved last night um, at council. So as I said before, um, we wanna look at conservation of wetlands and floodplains. And these are the two projects that were approved by the watershed uh, initiative. One is the Ward Creek floodplain acquisition and the other is the Bayou de Planche floodplain acquisition. The, the point of this is to purchase this land and leave it as floodplain in perpetuity so that it cannot be developed. And we want to, so that we can maintain that floodplain storage. So the schedule, we started phase two uh, last year in January and we're expecting to get the project completed in July of 2022. And what you see here are the major tasks associated with the plan and then the schedule for each of those tasks. And then the right hand side, the percent completion of where we are today. And I wanna focus on that understanding the flood risk modeling assessment. That is the task that we are working on right now, getting those models built out, calibrated and, and, the, and the flood risk assessment completed so that then we can move on to the next item, which is the developing the projects and policies to mitigate the flood risk. And I know everyone's very concerned about codes and ordinances. And so um, we're hoping to have additional recommendations by May of 2022. So that just gives the overall schedule. Now, how can you help? I'm going to tell you. There are actually a number of things you can do. Uh, first off, our, one of our concerns, and people complain, have a lot of 311 calls, is because of the debris and stuff in the actual storm system structures in the street. Um, so we recommend don't throw your litter in the street, keep your leaves and your grass cuttings, et cetera, out of the street. Those actually contribute to the um, clogging up of the system. And the other thing, my pet peeve is not picking up your beads after the parades. I love the parades too, but I wish people would pick up the beads. The other thing you can do is slow the water flow from off of your property. How do we do that? Uh, rain barrels are one, rain gardens is another, um, disconnecting downspouts from the storm sewer system directly so that they flow over land. Um, so there are a number of methods to utilize. And we also want people to attend the watershed public meetings. What is that? So tonight is our parish-wide virtual public meeting. We plan to have watershed specific related meetings going forward. We're gonna start with targeted stakeholders for each of these watersheds. And, and then we hope to utilize those people to get the word out regarding the stormwater master plan and have them um, inform those people so that they can be engaged then in the public meeting because we do want the feedback. 
So the intent is to have these watershed meetings over the next six months from July through December. So those, so be on the lookout for those. Um, and then the last is submit your flooding photos. People have been doing that so far and it's been great. We're taking that information, we're putting it in a GIS database so that we can see where all of these are and where they are in relation to um, the different watersheds. And then also we can use that information to validate our models. So if our model is not showing flooding, but you're showing flooding on your photos, then we need to reconcile that. So those photos are important to us. And so how can you submit those photos? Um, there's a number of ways. You can email them at info at stormwater.brla.gov. You can post them using the hashtag, hashtag BR stormwater, EBR stormwater. And then you can send a uh, direct messenger on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Jonathan. Thank you, Melissa. And so as Melissa shared a lot of information with you all tonight, we want to encourage you to view the virtual open house that's available on the project's website at stormwater.brla.gov. There you will find a wealth of information as it relates to the stormwater master plan. It will give you his, a historical overview of how we have arrived to the point today and give you more in-depth information about many of the things we discussed today. So please, as you have opportunity, uh, visit the project website and take a look at the virtual open house. And also at any point you have questions, um, you can email us at info at stormwater.brla.gov or follow, I encourage you to follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Stormwater EBR. And so we've received uh, several questions and comments already tonight. If you are just joining us and you have a question and or comment, uh, we encourage you to use that join the podium button that you see there uh, to the right of your screen. There you can submit your question and the project team is prepared to receive those questions. Once you click join the podium, you will see a dialogue box pop up there in that box. Uh, you can submit the information you want to have answered by the project team. And so we received a lot of questions. And so we wanna bring up uh, Melissa back up to answer a few questions. The first of which we've received is, are there any plans to remove the collapsed bridge in Dawson's Creek? Um, I, I don't know that specifically, but that seems like a project that we would definitely want to do because a collapsed bridge is going to cause a uh, constriction. So, um, I don't, I don't know which bridge you're talking about. And if it's not one that can be removed, but may need to be replaced, that would be something we need to talk with the parish or, or the owner, if it's not a parish owned structure. Is H and TB sending cameras down the drains to figure out what is happening? No. So, um, when we started to evaluate the subsurface system, the parish did not really have a lot of information. So it took a lot of time and effort and money to get the information we did. But I will say in the structures themselves, we did put down 360 degree video um, of each structure. So the parish has that in the GIS database that they can utilize. We did not though put cameras through the pipe system but the parish is going to do that in areas of where, um, based on the collected data so far, that they have issues. So they're going to do some of that. Can you provide any update on the Comet River project? Oh, I, I know there it's in various phases of design and construction, but I don't have the details. Are there any current assessments being done in the Shenandoah area to assess uh, current development and future development? So um, when we say addressing current development and future development, we are going to um, evaluate development more on a whole scale, but we will be utilizing the models to do that. So, um, so that's gonna be coming, but I can't say it's going to be a specific development here or there. 
but we are going to be looking at that, the impacts of development over time. Is the stormwater capacity of the drainage system being surpassed at an increasing frequency? So that's a good question. That is when I showed you the one map with the whole bunch of smaller watersheds, that's part of what we're evaluating. We utilize the PC swim model to do that. And that model cannot take into consideration um, the debris and, and the condition of the structure. So when we evaluate those systems, we're assuming they're functioning correctly. So if the model shows that they're still flooding based on what it was designed for, then we know that there is a capacity issue. Um, and I'm gonna say, you know, some of the areas in the parish are extremely old. So we are certain we're gonna find areas in where the capacity has been exceeded. Is the current data collection process taken into account future development? Um, the, when you say the data collection process, um, we collected the data to evaluate or to you to, to put into the models to evaluate the system. Um, so what we can do, we have LIDAR, which gives us the topography of the ground, the elevation. So we can use the models to adjust that elevation to see what the impact is of a development. And that's sort of what we did when we developed the plans for the floodplain preservation um, projects through the watershed initiative. We actually took those sites and said, okay, if we were to develop them, what would be the impact? And so we, we can do that. We will be doing more of that. I don't know if that answers the question or not. Is the flood risk modeling and other study data completed by HNTB available for public review? Um, the modeling, okay, so when, when we do all of this work, we have a rigorous quality control program. So it is reviewed, but it's not reviewed by the public. Um, I believe the intent uh, going forward the data that's been collected on the subsurface system, the parish is evaluating um, what information they are going to make public. And then also once we get done with the models, we will provide those to the parish for utilization. I think the intent will be for utilization by the public. Are there any plans to implement any ordinances that will require green infrastructure and new developments as they are consuming all land surrounding them with non impervious material? Okay, so that's a good question. And as I said earlier, there were some interim policy recommendations that were approved by um, council just last week. And one of those was we recommended taking the the green infrastructure cross sections within the MOVE BR program and apply those to new development. So those cross sections are now in the development code for new development. Um, I, I don't think they're mandated to be utilized, but they're in there to be utilized as options for addressing some stormwater. And they actually are nicer sections. So. I'm waiting. Jonathan's searching for more questions. Multiple parish use the Ameet River for their drainage. Will this plan try to coordinate with them on drainage and development? Uh, so I, I, all of those parishes mentioned are part of region seven of the watershed initiative. And that is somewhat the goal of the watershed initiative is to get these parishes to come together to meet on common ground and develop some of these things. So they are consistent be between parishes. Um, we have been coordinating with Ascension. Uh, we're sharing data with them and um, you know, the regional model that we're utilizing, that can be utilized by Ascension as well. So I, I will say EBR was very adamant about whatever we do, making sure that we're not gonna put more water 
on ascension. So there is that, there is that coordination and sharing of data. Will the parish's watershed models be available to evaluate the individual drainage or watershed impact of a new neighborhood or business and be used in development review? Will it be incorporated into evaluations for future planning and zoning decisions? So that, that is something that the parish is looking forward to do in the future. So we'll give the models to the parish and they will, I think the intent is to make them available to utilize for the developer who will then put their development in that model. And then those models will be updated based on those developments as they go in so that the model is continually updated. That's kind of the goal. How will those models dovetail with the Amy River Basin watershed model being developed by the state? So um, we, we've been in coordination with the watershed initiative. Um, Region seven is Dewberry. We've already been coordinating with them. Uh, we've used some of the data that they previously collected. The way they're doing the modeling is a little bit different than the way we're doing the modeling. Um, and I would need a modeler here to go into the technical details of what that really means and what it looks like. Um, but the intent that we were doing, again, was to be able to look at the smaller watersheds um, and come up with projects for there. The, the watershed initiative models are not drilling down into the level of detail that we are. Now, when it comes to the regional watershed, they'll be similar, but again, their methodology is a little bit different. We're utilizing what is referred to as a rain on grid evaluation and theirs does not. What is the schedule for the clearing and widening of Bayou Manchek? <sighs> Uh, right now, um, I don't know that there are plans for Bayou Manchac. I know it is a concern. Uh, one of the problems with Bayou Manchac is that I, it's, it's considered, I think it's a state historic uh, stream or river, which means there's, there's restrictions on what you can and can't do on that bayou. But I, I will tell you that we do know that at the downstream end of Bayou Manchac, everything has to go under I-10, has to go under Perkins, has to go under airline and under a railroad. So there's all those four little bottlenecks that all of Bayou Manchac has to get out to get to Amy River. And that's something that we're going to be looking at. Is this plan looking at pier and beam construction as a flood mitigation measure? Well, um, like I said, we're gonna be looking at the impacts of fill and we wanna focus on low impact development. And you know, there's always the option to do pier and beam um, construction. Um, and you know, depending on what we find out on fill and maybe fill limitations, it, it may be a default that that, that that will just have to be considered. I don't know yet. Um, so we'll, we'll see. That's part of what we want to evaluate. Will you mandate zero runoff increase for new development via pervious concrete paving, gravel, drain, swells between properties? It, it's a possibility. <laughs> Uh, again, we want to evaluate that. And so it's, it's, it's a definitely a possibility. And, and I will say there, uh, the other, one of the other um, changes to the codes that was approved last week is for the drainage impact studies that are required, the developer has to do what is called a conveyance check. And so they have to use a, um, a computer model to evaluate the conveyance of the system around and through their site to make sure that there are no upstream and downstream impacts. So that's, that's a new item in the code. Are you researching pumps in strategic locations? Oh, uh, that is definitely something that we will consider. Um, so I, I'm going to say yes. I can't say where or at this time. We don't know.
A portion of land on Perkins Road was developed, was once designated as wetlands. Was any of the land adjacent to the Mall of Louisiana designated as a wetland? Was the, uh, I'm sorry, say that last part again. Was any of the land what? Adjacent to the Mall of Louisiana designated as a wetland. I, I can't, I can't answer that. Um, I, I do know uh, the core is responsible for permitting wetlands. So uh, there are requirements when you fill in a wetland, you are either supposed to mitigate those impacts or buy credits within the watershed. Um, that is also one of the things I wanna look at. I wanna look at and see how that is working because again, the course focus is on the environmental impacts and not so much the, the, the flood risk reduction of utilizing wetlands. So I, I don't know about that specific location. Are there any plans to increase the drainage capacity of canals and bayous to handle the additional rainfall runoff water? Um, again, uh, we will look at that. The, the concern about increasing the capacity of some of the channels is that you increase then the flow potentially downstream. So to offset that, you also want to look at some detention requirements to, to mitigate that increase in the channel. But again, these are all, all items that are open for discussion and evaluation. And, and I do encourage you as we move forward, some of these are very specific questions related to very specific watersheds. So when we get into those watershed meetings, I will encourage you to attend those and, and discuss more of these very specific um, type questions. Will you be considering a requirement that new development reduce runoff compared with the pre-development condition? Uh, again, that's another, that's an option, definitely open for consideration. We're still, we're evaluating, looking for questions. I think there's probably a lot of repeats, so he's trying not to find a, a question that's already been asked. I guess you guys have lots and lots of questions that are a little maybe too specific for me to answer here and so we're skipping over some of those uh, again if they're if they're if they're that specific I probably will not be able to answer them here um, uh, and again um, it might be more appropriate for the different watershed meetings that we're going to be having How would a plan to conserve land and bar development for floodplain mitigation be paid for long term? Say that one again, please. How would a plan to conserve land and bar development for floodplain mitigation be paid for long term? Um, well, I'm, 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 I'm struggling that with because the one part assumes another part, which may or may not be true. Um, so as, as we find areas where we want to preserve the land, uh, the parish will have to purchase it and, and, and have it um, deeded. I don't, I don't know the legalities of that, but have it deeded so that it can't be developed. Um, and then in terms of, um, I, and I don't know if that's what you meant. So you're barring development of that property, then that's how that is done. Um, and then again, long-term, it should be deeded that way so that nobody can develop it. Um, and in terms of, again, of the long-term funding of the program, it, you know, there, there's these projects that we're looking at that we're trying to find as much, you know, federal state programs that will help pay for things. And, and then trying to find, um, there's gonna have to be a revenue source 
to, to keep everything maintained. I mean, you see it now. The, there's problems with the system. There's channels that have obstructions. There's the, the subsurface system. There's you know inlets full of, of debris. It, it, it costs money to clean all that out. And so I'm, I'm hoping working with the parish to one, identify all of those various maintenance costs so that we can determine what that uh, revenue will need to be. So, and then we can determine, you know, how is that going to be funded? How can the public make recommendations for infrastructure revisions or improvements? And how does a resident get involved in the solution? Okay, again, that's where we're, we're talking about those separate um, watershed meetings. Um, and, and again, you know, we want feedback from the public. So I, I don't have the schedule of those. We don't, we haven't identified that schedule yet. It's, it's contingent on when each of those model watersheds get their flood risk assessment completed, and then we'll start scheduling those. But just, just keep monitoring the website, monitoring, monitoring your social media, and we'll put out information on that. And we'll want people to attend those meetings. And oh, and, and we have, we'll have your email, we have your emails as you registered tonight. So if you have a comment, uh, you know, you, you can put that in there and, and we keep track of all of that. What is the plan to remove floating trash from watersheds and stormwater flowing through the parish? Okay, so, um, I, I didn't touch a whole lot. I actually, I didn't touch very much on water quality at all. Um, as we develop projects um, for um, the program, ours will include a, a water quality component. In other words, we wanna make sure whatever we design will not um, have negative impacts on the water quality. We are working with the parish environmental department right now they're responsible for what is called the MS4 permit, the municipal separate storm sewer system permit, which regulates the water quality. So we're working with them. They are actually um, looking at those types of things, looking at um, trash booms, looking at trash collectors, uh, not only in channels, but also in some of the, the subsurface structures. So. The, there is the parish environmental department that is working on that right now. Because they, they recognize that there is an issue as we all do. Is there somewhere that the public can view the maps of the current flood drainage system? Um, no, but uh, the parish is actually um, looking at that and determining what data that they are going to make uh, available to the public. Um, I was in a meeting with them not too long ago. There is going to be, they will probably make um, a map of the system itself available. And, and they will caveat that, that we did not collect 100% of the structures. Um, Again, it would have been just astronomical. We did not include obviously private developments. We did not include a lot of the state routes or state owned property. Um, and that includes like LSU Southern. We did not include the other municipalities that are responsible for their own systems such as Baker Central and Zachary. Um, and then there were just areas that originally were a ditch with driveway culvert system. Um, older areas of the parish where a lot of people have filled in the ditches and put in their own um, pipe system. So we found instead of, instead of a typical street where you might have four inlets per block, we were finding up to like 20 different structures per block and it was it was just too much to try and collect everything. So we focused on the outfalls into the ditches and whatnot and where the drainage goes from those um, areas. I hope that answer is probably a very long-winded answer. All right, just take a
So Jonathan, I think you indicated that uh, some of the questions are really related to, or really are for parish personnel to respond to. Um, so uh, do we, what's our plan for um, responding to comments that maybe we're not answering tonight? So any comments that are deemed uh, parish specific, uh, we will take your comment, get the appropriate individual to respond to it, and you will receive an email uh, with the response to that comment. Thanks. Okay, we have about uh, three minutes left. We're gonna continue taking questions during this time. Again, we're trying to find questions that are not so specific and not that we need the parish to respond to. Should concrete foundations be discontinued in developments located in known floodplains? And should retention ponds be required with no waivers allowed? Um, I'm not, okay, so concrete foundations, I'm assuming you mean slab on grade as opposed to like a raised structure. That's, I'm kind of guessing. Um, again, we're, we're going to be evaluating the policies for development in flood zones. Um, what was the second part of that about? And should retention ponds be required with no waivers allowed? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's a reason for detention ponds. It's to, it's to mitigate the increase in, in runoff. Um, so I'd have to, we'll have to look at that again. I, I, don't, I don't have all the codes memorized, so I don't know some of the in intricacies of what the waivers are for. What projects are currently on, underway to mitigate stormwater uh, flooding? Um, okay, so as, as we said, uh, the, obviously the Comey River diversion in, in construction and various phases ongoing. Um, the Corps of Engineers Tributaries project is um, expected to start construction, I think, at the end of summer. And um, as I said, the $20 million allocated from the CARES Act to the uh, maintenance of the system, the, the parish is utilizing some of that money immediately to go address some of the subsurface um, issues. So. Um, those are ongoing. I, as I said, the hazard mitigation projects and the LWI projects uh, will be happening soon. They've all been approved. The funding's approved. We just have to move forward on the design process. And, and I, I just want to caveat that because, you know, I, I can hear you saying, well, if the money's there and the project's approved, why aren't we, why aren't we moving? Um, when you get federal funds, there are, there are certain things that have to be done. You have to follow certain rules and regulations for that funding. And so there, there's kind of like a checklist of things that have to happen and a process that you have to follow in order for the whole um, project to proceed and how the project proceeds. So I, I hear you. It, it's taking a long time. You know, we have one of the mitigation projects is at Ward Creek, right at Segan Lane. It's a, it's a constriction there. It's not a complicated project, but it's very frustrating because we have to follow um, the overall process. And, and like I said, that one is, has been um, awarded to a design consultant and is proceeding. Are the downstream parishes going to participate in this plan or any alternate plan to allow for an improvement in water flow? So, so we actually have, we are engaging the um, adjacent parishes as well as the other communities. We, we have what I call our, our partners meeting um, 
which includes the adjacent parishes, includes the watershed initiative, includes the Amy River Basin Development Commission, includes um, uh, Baker Central, Zachary, um, LSU, um, all these other entities that have a stakeholder, a stake in, in what happens to the water. So yes, we are including them. So we, cause we wanna make sure they know what we're doing and vice versa. I, we need to understand what others are doing as well. And, oh, and I forgot FEMA and the core. Have you considered using swim rather than a heck res for the models? So um, as the, the watershed models that we showed on the map with the 11 watersheds, we're using heck res. Uh, for the smaller subsurface, uh, the smaller watersheds, which are for the subsurface system, we are using SWIM. So we're using both of those models. We're still finding more. Are we done with questions? So, Jonathan, any closing remarks? And I just want to say thank you, everybody. I really, you had good questions. I appreciate all of them. If we didn't answer them tonight, uh, we will still get answers to you. Um, again, up there on the uh, slide is how to contact us. Um, we'll have a record of your questions. We have your email address, so we will be able to answer those. Jonathan, anything else? Thanks. Once again, thank you. This recording will be available within 72 hours on the project website. You see the information there on your screen. And we look forward to seeing you in your parish, uh, in your, I'm sorry, your watershed specific uh, meetings over the next few months. Thank you.